Hello, my name is uh, Philip Regeer, and I am the University Dean for Education in Initiatives at Arizona State University, and the CEO of an organization within the university called EdPlus. EdPlus is the organization within the university that's responsible for advancing everything that the university does with digital teaching and learning technology. Uh, it is my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, the person who's going to uh, welcome you to campus, President Michael Crow. President Crow began his tenure at ASU in July of 2014, in July of tw 2002, and since that time he has transformed this university into a new model for what an American research public university can be. Uh, that is exemplified by two important characteristics of the university. First, we do uh, research that advances public value. Uh, that is exemplified by last year's research expenditures, which exceeded over $620 million. Uh, in terms of non-medical research expenditures, that is more research expenditures in universities such as Columbia, Harvard, University of Chicago, UCLA. At the same time, and simultaneously, we provide access to the university to an increasing number of students as a public university should. We have increased the number of on-campus students from 50,000 to well over 75,000, and increased the number of online students to over 40,000 in the current academic year. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce President Michael M. Crow, the 16th president of Arizona State University. Thank, thank you, Phil. I feel a little bit weird standing up on this stage, so there must be some reason for this stage. Just good morning, everybody. Welcome to Arizona. Welcome to ASU. I was telling uh, some folks earlier, you know, that uh, a lot of people that haven't been to Arizona before, and for, how many have not been to Arizona before? Yeah. Well, we just got electricity here like three years ago, <laughs> and, and the first uh, 13 or 14 years I was here at the university, we didn't have any electricity. And so it was, it was really hard to just get some things done. And now once we got electricity, man, we, can, we have computers and video screens and learning analytics is like a really important thing to us And since, because you need electrons for some of that and not all of it, but some of it. So, so uh, here's, what, here's what we decided some time ago. So a lot of great uh, private universities in the United States have turned themselves into honors colleges and they only admit A students. I came from one of those, Columbia University. I used to be a trustee of another one called Bowdoin College. A lot of great public universities have done the same thing. For various reasons, they've decided to become honors colleges, and they only admit students of the highest, highest academic qualification out of high school. How many of you were A-plus students in high school? Yeah, quite a few of you. How many were A students in high school? B students in high school? How many of you were below B students in high school? Yeah, well, too bad for you B and C students, because I can give you the list of the top 100 colleges and universities in the United States. You ain't going. You got no way to get in. None. So there's a few of us out there, including us, including us demonstrably. The easiest way for me to think about how to raise what was then thought of as uh, America's largest and most successful party school, that was us, into a modern and fully functional research university uh, was to do two things. The first thing was to wipe out the bottom half of the freshman class, those students coming in with B averages. And the second thing was to build a medical school. Now, you know that in, uh, when all college and university presidents, you know, all go to hell. And when you arrive in hell, you're given some things to actually work with. You're given a football team <laughs> and two medical schools. <laughs> and, so, and so we decided not to do a medical school, but to partner with others and so forth and so on. And we decided not to cut out the bottom half of our freshman class, but to embrace the bottom half of our freshman class and to ma maintain the possibility that in the United States you could still build an unbelievably egalitarian university that actually admitted everyone that was qualified, not the people that were super qualified, the people that were actually qualified. Admit them, and then, oh, by the way, say that the public university was a failure, a failure, unless its student body was representative of the totality of socioeconomic diversity. And oh, by the way, if you do have a student body that's representative of the totality of socioeconomic diversity, which we do. I didn't want that up yet. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, 
If you, did, if, you, if you do have that student body, which we do, then you're operating on a more egalitarian basis. And you, by the way, capture, in fact, you overcapture ethnic diversity if you capture socioeconomic diversity. So almost no research university in the United States, almost no university in the United States is representative of the totality of socioeconomic diversity. Uh, we are, which took us 13 years to accomplish. So here's an example. We have 3,100 Native American students on campus from 225 Native American tribes. And I always hear from people that are largely ignorant about Native American tribes, they say, well, do you have 200 tribes in Arizona? We say, no, we have 23 tribes in Arizona. And we have students from 200 other tribes that come here because we have a system, a program, a design which warmly welcomes them to this institution, both financially, pedagogically, from an outcomes perspective, from an achievements perspective. So long story short, before I move to this, where we are, because I, really, I was really excited to be able to, have to come over here because, as I said to uh, your leadership team, uh, we need everything that you all are working on. You people are too slow. We need more advanced learning analytics. We need more, better, faster tools. We need them proven. We need them tested because we're working up against a really, really cruel thing. The disbelief of egomaniacal faculty members who believe that the only way that you can learn or prove learning is in a small classroom with a single faculty member working with a small number of students under the tutelage of the great mind and that from that tutelage of that great mind somehow then learning actually occurs. And we're like, okay, who could ever build enough colleges or universities to ever educate the number of people that we need to educate at the university level to fill that within that model? And the answer is, that's somebody else's problem. Well, we decided to take that problem on. So we changed everything. Most importantly, faculty culture. This is not a faculty-centric university. This is a student-centric university. And our faculty would be the first to agree with that. They're actually the third priority in the institution. The first priority is the students. You're in our student government headquarters, designed by them, all of our coalitions, every group that we have. It's a very different kind of place student-centric. The second group that we're focused on is the community, not the faculty. And finally, the third group that we're really focusing our energy on is the faculty themselves. So we changed the culture, empowered the design. We eliminated 80 academic units. We created Phil's unit and gave it uh, every technological tool that anyone could find, linking up with everyone that's out there to find new ways to change how we are able to operate. We then built a student body that is actually completely and comprehensively representative of the socioeconomic diversity of our country. We then mushed all of this together, design empowerment of our faculty, student centrism of our culture. We changed the clock speed of the university. So if, how many of you work at universities? I mean, clock speed, they, the clocks, most of them don't even work on the walls anywhere. They, nobody actually cares what time it is. The smallest unit of time is a 50-minute class. The next smallest unit of time is a semester. All academic decisions take between 8 and 14 semesters. And it's just too slow. So we changed clock speed also. If it's important, therefore, it must be important enough to do quickly to do at least with dispatch to make things happen. So we mushed all this together, all these changes. So in 2002, uh, or since 2002, here's some things that all these changes have produced. So student body now representative of all socioeconomic diversity, 75,000 on-campus students, up from 47,000 on-campus students, doubled the four-year graduation rate across all groups of students, we now have the highest four-year graduation rate of any research university that admits A and B students to its freshman class. There's a lot of really proud schools out there. They're really so proud, like where I came from at Columbia, just ever so proud. They have a really high four-year graduation rate. Of course, they only admit the maniacal geniuses from high school. Like, they don't even need to go to college, and you're so happy that they graduated. <laughs> so double the four-year graduation rate. We have three times the number of graduates. So we went to 25,000 graduates. We'll graduate this year from 8,000. Five times the level of research, 15 times the number of learners. We have hundreds of thousands of learners connected to us from 195 countries using learning platforms. We have the first accredited, or among the first accredited online undergraduate engineering degrees, unbelievable adaptive learning systems, un unbelievable uh, analytical systems, by which we get also huge amounts of doubt 
So we have people coming here to review us for accreditation, and they say, your data is all wrong. You must be liars. Liars, that's like fighting words. And you're in Arizona, and let me tell you how fights go in Arizona. This is the old west, buddy. Step outside. <laughs> and so we've convinced most people, but not all. But what we need help with is where we're headed. So let me show you this chart here. So if you look at the far left of this chart, this is sort of where we're headed. We now have, uh, uh, actually, we actually trademarked the term universal learner. So if you need that, just let us know. <laughs> and so under our idea of universal learner, we're trying to alter the way that we're thinking about the university. So blue, pre-K, the kid at home, the kid in some kind of home environment. What, what we need out of step one is verbal and conceptual empowerment, an empowered learner. Maximum vocabulary, vocabulary, maximum conceptual capability. Every asset, every resource, every learning tool, every learning analytic, everything possible to get the child to that blue threshold. That blue threshold then is ready to engage in more formal learning. Lots of different types, homeschooling, charter schools, parochial schools, public schools, online, whatever. I mean, they're all going to operate. If you have preferences for any of them, just you know, keep your preferences to yourself and don't try to destroy someone else's preferences. This is another thing that goes on here in Arizona. You can actually do what you want here. And so in that K-12 window, what we're after is a fully prepared learner being produced. Now, that has to be analytically demonstrated. We have to understand what a fully prepared learner is, and we have to be able to demonstrate that in every possible way. Something probably other than just these simple, you know, we're behind in the fourth grade math test. We're behind in third grade reading. That's it. Reading and math, those are the two things that we're going to measure in some sort of standard way. They're among the things that we need to measure. So we need a lot of help in the measurement of the green zone. Then we're of the view that once you're the prepared learner, and we need to get 90% of the people through high school before 18 or before 16, we think that the, the things about allowing people to drop out of high school are stupid. We think that the, uh, the notion that somehow people have to be 18 to get out of high school, that's probably also stupid. It depends where you are. Are you ready to move now on into, are you a prepared learner? And when you're a prepared learner measured somehow, and you all have to give us the tools of measurement at every possible level, also highly individualized, since I guarantee you there's no two people in this room that learn the same way, think the same way, process the same way, how could it possibly be? Think about the people that you live with. You can't even agree what to, where to go to dinner. You can't agree how to raise your children. I mean, it's all kinds of funny, different kinds of things. And so imagine learning is, is much more complicated than that. Then the prepared learner, by whatever means necessary, becomes what we call a lifelong learner, or what we're, what we, what we're trademarking as universal learner. Then all we're trying to show by this squiggly slide is that some go to college, some don't. Now, by the way, those that go to college, half of those that go to college in the United States at 17 or 18 go and never graduate, more than half. More than half never graduate. We haven't done enough assessment. We haven't done enough individualization. We haven't done enough customization. We haven't recognized all the things that you all can measure. What is the intelligence type of this particular learner? What's the makeup of this learner? What's the, what's the capacity? What's the empowerment of this learner? What's the pathway for this learner's success down to the individual? down to the individual. So then we're building a university that then takes 75,000 undergraduates on campus with us, or 75,000 students on campus with us, and creates a learning environment for them, greatly enhanced, and what we need is we need learning analytics in every class, every mechanism, every, every step along the way, measuring learning progress, learning outcomes, learning thresholds, learning connections, and so forth. Tools, devices, systems, we have some, we have many, we have hundreds of them deployed. Now, what percentage of kids go to college or, or university? Not very many. A lot go to community colleges, a lot go into the military, a lot go to work. And so the notion then is how do we create a learning platform with learning assessments along the way which squiggle through a person's life? So they need a tech, we have technical schools here and other pathways just as, just as the, the top and the bottom on the far right. Just as examples, you might go to technical school, you might pick up a coding skill, you might go to art school, culinary school, you might learn this, you might learn that, you might become a fabulous gardener in this gardening club that you're a part of. All these learning outcomes are unbelievably valuable. We don't recognize more than half of them. We don't assess most of them. We don't know how to link any of them together. We don't know how to measure the actual performance of the learner across this spectrum of activity. What we do is we say, well, we've got these colleges and you need to go there before you're 22. 
and do really well, and I'm really sorry that your mother had cancer. So it turns out there's 35 million people in the United States that didn't graduate from college, and if you listen to all their stories, they all have a story. They're also all very angry. We know this, we have 11,000 of them as our students in our Starbucks project alone. Anger is the thing that we were not ready for. Resentment, anger. I'm a great learner, I'm a great student. This is what happened to me when I was a freshman at Princeton. I left there with a 0.8 grade, 0.08 grade point and they didn't wanna to talk to me after that anymore. And so what we are trying to do is try to design a way in which we can embrace learners across the entirety of their life, including when they're here with us. So we have 75,000 on-campus students learning with us in a completely modified learning environment. That's maybe a quarter of the total modification done. We have 40,000 online degree-seeking students admitted to the university pursuing very advanced online degrees. How many of you have actually taken an online course that wasn't something out of the 1970s? Yeah, so a, hand, a handful of you. So most people critique things and talk about online things. They don't even know what it is. We'll get you signed up for our digital photography course. Where's Phil? We'll get you signed up for some of our courses if you want to see what an actual modern online course is like, what a modern online lab is like, what a system that can do signal processing and electronic circuit design is actually capable of doing in modern computationally based, computationally driven learning, and then think about the learning analytics of all of that. And then in addition to the 75,000 on-campus degree seekers and the 40,000 online degree seekers, we have 600,000 or so other people who are mulling around and milling around inside our learning environment, sampling a course, taking a course, looking at our global freshman academy from 195 countries. We thought, hey, if we could do that, I bet we could really put something online that could really help high school students or people that want to go back and rethink what they had at high school. So we deployed a little digital preparatory academy. We've got 12,000 learners. We haven't even advertise the thing yet. Don't even know what we're doing. And so the point here, and this is really my final point for all of you, if you've got ideas, if you've got tools, if you've got analytics, you, you all are the cavalry. You are the people coming to help win the battle associated with how we're going to modernize learning, how we're going to do this. How are we going to do the blue, the green, and the orangish looking thing there? How are we gonna make all of that happen? Without the tools that can prove learning outcomes, without the tools that can enhance learning outcomes, without the analytic capability to know what we're doing, we're gonna to continue to be thwarted by, here's a really, really weird English phrase, filiopietistic constraints. People who are only about tradition. I got into an argument with, my, uh, with the president of Columbia University on the radio a few years ago where he said, you know, everybody needs to go to college and they need to go to college for four years. There's one way to do college. I said, yeah, there's one way to do college, especially if you're rich. It's to find somebody to give you a scholarship to go to Columbia for $70,000 a year or your parents to pay for you to go to Columbia for $70,000 a year, to be immersed with a world-class faculty and to use that as a learning experience. If that is the answer to educational outcomes, then we will fail. He doesn't like me. And so, and so that's, that's a way. And if you can get in and you can afford it, it's a fabulous way. But if you can't, there might need to be other ways and we have tried to build one of those other ways. So, um, let's see. Did they warn you about the flying scorpions? <laughs> Is anybody staying below the fifth floor of their hotel? <laughs> anybody? Some of you? All right, did, you, did they give you the black lights? So the black lights is how you see the scorpions in your room. You can't see them without the black lights. Now everybody knows there's scorpions in Arizona, right? It's the flying ones you gotta watch out for. <laughs> They're really, they don't bother you unless you're below the fifth floor, so. <laughs> All right, so, so you happen to be, by the way, just to orient you, you're on one of our four academic campuses, although we don't run ourselves as a system, we have no academic, we only have deans on our campuses, we have no provosts or chancellors or anything like that on any of our campuses, including we have a campus nine miles from here that has 13,000 students on it in downtown Phoenix. We also have four innovation campuses, including one where our Ed Plus program is, uh, is located, and we operate all of this through the technological wonders of the present day world. Uh, as a single thing. So just on behalf of everybody that's here, our 30,000 staff, 
our 115,000 students, you know, the people that we've got associated with the university, I just want to welcome you to Arizona State. Thank you. So now, welcome, uh, LAC 2019. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon Xiao. Uh, I'm from a school of informa uh, computing informatics and decision systems engineering uh, in ASU. So I'm a system professor here. And along with uh, Jim Cunningham, Katie McCarthy, Grace Lynch, and Nico Hoover, uh, we organize uh, this event uh, with the entire team over here. So uh, thank you all very much uh, for coming for the first day. And we thank our sponsors, our principal sponsors, Michael Hill, Golden Sponsors, Saint Gage Canvas, Silver Sponsors, Blackboard, ACT. Uh, they will have uh, the sponsor booth set up right behind you after the keynote. Okay. So the news here, we are at the largest lack ever. <laughs> you. Well, thank you, everyone, and congratulations to you, too. We total have uh, 900 plus participants over the pa uh, these all five days, but we have the largest uh, registration, 525 unique uh, individuals. And there are 60% of the first-time attendees. Uh, where are all these first-time attendees? Welcome. So first thing first, uh, today's schedule, we have a busy schedule. You just came from uh, Arizona Bowl Room for the hot breakfast. So we are going to have the breakfast tomorrow as well, the same place. And uh, starting from 9 o'clock, uh, there will be this room for our keynote. And 10 to 10.30, and 2.30 uh, to 3, there will be our coffee break. And in between, there will be parallel sections. I will have a few more words about that. And uh, right after keynote, this will be the room for keynote Q&A and also the panel uh, parallel with the uh, other sessions. So today's special is at the end of today, 4.30, at the Arizona Bowl Room, right in the MU building, second floor, the largest room where you have the breakfast and also the lunch. It's going to be the speed mentoring sections. So this is something new for this uh, uh, lack. And the uh, most important thing, after that, we will have our uh, conference banquet dinner that's at the uh, Desert Botanical Garden. So this is not on campus. This is about uh, 4.2 uh, miles north. I will have a few words about that. And we organize the buses for you as well. So let me just speak a few words about new things in LAC 19. The first thing is the speed mentoring. Uh, thank all these uh, senior mentors, and I welcome you to uh, check out the sections, and also the networking section will be uh, in the same room as well. Second thing is uh, we have a longer poster and demos exposure. So right behind this room, you will have to set up uh, your poster before tomorrow's uh, evening's uh, poster receptions. And also, there will be uh, longer poster displays on tomorrow as well. Uh, please uh, just check them out right behind you during the, the break. The third is we manage, well, it's Arizona it's special. The average temperature now during this conference is above 72. So, well, uh, sorry for the uh, frozen lady uh, got arrested. Uh, we got it covered. And uh, since the beautiful weather's out there, we also utilize a lot of outdoor spaces. Uh, you may notice like there are so many tables set up in between MU and Student Pavilion. We'll come to use those as your meeting spaces. And tomorrow, we will have some more outdoor events as well. So today, just let me move on uh, for the program that our keynotes is going to be streamed. That's on ASU Live, so make sure that um, tweet this out. And uh, just a few words about the presentations. Uh, the full paper would have a total of 30 minutes, 25 uh, minutes for the presentation, and five minutes Q&A. 
and a short paper will be 15 minutes and uh, presentation, five minutes Q&A. So proceeding is also online uh, and in, on ACM's website as well and in your USB drives. And a poster and demos that will be right behind you uh, in this building. That's the student pavilions need a BNC uh, for the display. And tomorrow, there will be the poster receptions. And for the dinner, uh, that's where we are going to be, at Desert Botanical Garden. It's beautiful. And uh, the, that's 4.5 miles away from here. So the buses will pick you up right at the BAC building. Go to this direction, about five minutes walk, and all the information is online on the website, uh, in the app as well. And the first bus, first bus will depart at 5.30, and first bus come back will be 8.30 from a Botanical Garden. And Best Reviewer Awards uh, will be announced during the dinner. So make sure uh, you got your tickets ready. That's in your neck wallet. So uh, when you walk this direction for about five minutes, you need to see this sign, see those horses, that will be your pickup locations. And you are going to see our volunteers along the way uh, to help you. And uh, one thing to note, uh, the conference bag, uh, inside the conference bag, we have uh, the Tech Tattoo stickers uh, that is sponsored by uh, Engineering School. And also the Sparky uh, notes, sticky notes, sponsored by the uh, engineering school. And uh, all the leftover food uh, in this conference were donated uh, to the West Nut uh, organization. And if you do not want to take this uh, bag uh, back home, uh, please return it back to uh, the registration desk. So, well... Since uh, the weather is so good and uh, uh, our uh, organizing team actually managed to uh, give you the access by using this uh, lag pass that you could access to uh, our fitness center. And finally, the swimsuit is for swimming, not for the hot top uh, for lag, right? So uh, welcome to use uh, the facility. And also, uh, please, uh, we have the discount code for you uh, if you use the Lyft app. Uh, but make sure the new user, you have to punch in the code LEG C before you actually request the ride. And if you are existing uh, users of a LEG users, make, uh, make sure that you use another code LEG C19. So inside your NIC wallet, uh, there is a $10 gift card for on campus dining. You could use it for the Starbucks or any restaurants on uh, campus. And the SU app uh, is on SU Events. Download the SU Events app, S is like 19, and use your registered email uh, to like 19. Password will be like 2019. And you will have all the information, including all the sessions, plan on your schedules, keep your notes, and like 19 insider. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to our program committee. Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all here. Welcome also on the part of the program chairs. The program chairs, I mean, we are responsible for the handling of the submissions, uh, and we are in a way, we also track chairs for the research track, but we have other track chairs for a, lot, uh, a number of other tracks. And first, our thanks go to all the track chairs with whom we have cooperated very smoothly and very productively. And we are going to see the outcome. Also, thanks to all the reviewers who have done a great job, also the senior reviewers who have uh, steered the discussions around the papers and provided us with decision support uh, through the meta reviews that they produced. Um, so I think I should. So this is now uh, some figures, say the demographics of the conference and also through the conferences over the last years. You see that we have a stable basis of uh, submissions, and here it's the accepted. Uh, here it's uh, the number of submissions to the research track 
is uh, quite stable for the last four instances of the conference. For this year, we have a special increase in the uh, demos and posters and in the workshops. So Laura, Hiroaki, and El and Vitumir have done a great job on that. Um, for the quality of the conference, it's very important that we have uh, rigorous reviewing and uh, this also implies a certain selectivity. This number uh, of selectivity is often uh, also communicated when it comes to rating conferences. And we are stable at the 30% level. So over the uh, last years after the first two instances of the conference, this is quite stable, 33% overall for the research track this year. Uh, the geographical distribution, you see we are really um, represented by the submissions in, on all continents, except Antarctica. This is still something to do, maybe. Um, and not equally distributed. Um, this is the numbers, absolute numbers of the submissions. This is, um, yeah, I, I will not explain the details to you how these numbers are calculated. This is accepted papers with a certain weighting system. And more interestingly, this, this is corporations. So you see we have transcontinental corporations to a very, very huge extent. I was a bit surprised, as a European, that there were not so many European corporations visible here. And this is really true, but we have these transcontinental corporations, which is quite specific to this community. Uh, yeah. This was the introduction, just the demographics, and now I hand over to Chris for more details on the bibliometrics, I would say. Thanks, Alaric. So um, this slide, we show um, the conferences that we are uh, closely related to uh, and journals that we are closely related to based on citations, based on the proceedings of this year. So you can see that, uh, of course, uh, lots of uh, papers that we cite are from the LAC conference previously, but also from the Educational Data Mining Conference. And then you can see the selection of journals. And what's interesting uh, this year, so a number of these journals, J, uh, JLA, um, are our, our own society's journal, uh, Computers and Ed and Computers and Human Behavior have been there in the past, but there's actually a lot more of these smaller journals uh, that we're citing. Uh, the size is the number of citations, such as the Journal of Machine Learning Research, which is one of the premier journals uh, in the field. So we're becoming and continuing to grow in our interdisciplinary nature. Um, one signal that we look for is how the conference ranks versus other conferences. One example of that is Google, Google Scholar ranks uh, conferences in ed tech. Uh, they classify this under computer science and then ed tech. Um, and uh, last year we were number eight, the only conference in this list. Everything else are journals. This year we're number seven and still the only conference in this list. So I think this speaks to the importance of LAC and um, uh, how the papers here are being cited. Um, the topics of the submitted methods, so this visualization shows the relative amount of different methods that are being used based on uh, the data people provide when uh, they submit a paper, and so that we can actually see that there's a couple of, of, of large pieces in particular, so use and evaluation of learning analytics tools speaks to the very pragmatic nature of this conference, in that we're not just doing research in a vacuum, but we're trying to change the world with that research and then learning and instructional uh, design is another big one. And I'll say that all of these slides will make available afterwards because there's a lot of data geeks here so we can geek out and look and compare and slice how we see fit. Uh, the methods that are being used in papers, similarly, it's interesting to see two really dominant methods come out in this year's themes, uh, data mining and machine learning and modeling, and you might see some of that reflected in uh, some of uh, the sessions. However, there's actually a lot of other uh, uh, methods that are being used. So for instance, qualitative analysis, survey design, uh, visualization, and observational methods. And uh, so again, these will be made available afterwards. Um, one track at LAC historically has been looking at networks and social network analysis, and so these are our LAC accepted authors this year, and these are uh, co-publication networks, uh, so authors 
who are connected to one another, have published with one another. And you can see in this large blue uh, area that uh, a third of the community is connected just by the publications and uh, uh, collaborations at this conference. So for those of you who are new to this conference, it is a very collaborative society. So I welcome you to uh, try and drum up collaborations here this, uh, this week uh, because there's a lot of interest in that. Dragon Gasovic. Where are you, Dragon? Where's Dragon? And Dragon's back here. So Dragon Gasovic, who's one of the co-founders of uh, uh, Solar, is the biggest node uh, uh, on, uh, in this network uh, with a great number of papers, seven or eight papers that he was involved in this year. So we started thinking about how would we actually recognize uh, that and uh, reflecting as we go into our 10-year history, uh, or our 10-year conference next year, we decided uh, that it was time for the Gasovic number. And so this is, as, as, as uh, our chair uh, contribution to you, a new Gasovic number. So for those who are unfamiliar, it comes from an Erdos number. It's the number of hops you are away from Dragon Gasovic. So if you're if you co-published with him, you have a Gasovic number of one. Uh, if you co-publish with somebody who's co-published with him, you have a Gasovic number of two, and so forth. So for instance, uh, Cecil, uh, who hopefully is here, uh, uh, co-authored one paper this year with Scott Crosley. Scott Crosley has co-authored uh, co two papers with Dragon Gasovic, so Cecil's uh, Gasovic number is two. Xiao Ying, you can follow Dong Dong, Jing Fei, Wan, Dragon. So that's a Gasovic number of four. And so in these network diagrams, and again, these will be available, you can explore a little bit. So Ben Motz, for instance, is here uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, co-authored with Ken Katinger, who co-authored with Ryan Baker, who's our keynote today, who co-authored with Dragon. And so Ben, uh, your Gasovic number is roughly three. So what's your Gasovic number? Here's one way to, to explore that a little bit. Now, they, this index is mostly CS conferences, so it might not be precise. But what's even better is we have a great networking session. So get to know the Gasovic himself uh, at, at the networking session and to talk to others about what your Gasovic number is. And uh, let's see how many more are connected next year. Oh, and a big thanks to Javier. Javier, where's Javier? Javier does these every year. For the community, uh, just volunteers it. We're indebted to him uh, for these graphics and these analyses of our proceedings. So thank you, Javier. I'll turn it to Rebecca for discussion about reviewers. So I'm going to finish the program chair session by talking about our wonderful reviewers, which includes so many of you in this room. Um, as you know, we take reviewing really seriously at LAC. Uh, we think it's a great way of um, bringing the community together, helping us to support each other, improving the quality of our work, working out where to go next. Um, so I thought you'd give you some stats about what's happening with the reviewing. Um, most of you who reviewed did three or more papers. The majority of those are on time. You could do better next year. You could do better next year. I want to see a better number next year. Uh, Good, long, decent comments going on, and um, the concordance with the final decision. About two-thirds of the reviewers concurred with the final decision. And we're not too unhappy about that because we like to see um, a bit of discussion and disagreement and coming together about that. Um, so, as Sharon mentioned, we're going to be giving uh, awards for the best reviewers at the dinner tonight. Uh, we just wanted to tell you who the highly commended reviewers were, because unlike the nominations for best paper, you don't see them in the program. Um, we filtered down on the people who delivered um, before the deadline, who'd done at least four reviews, who'd engaged with the meta review phase, who'd written decently long reviews, thoughtful reviews, and then we read all the reviews. So those are the three people who are up for the award from the main program committee. But we also had the senior reviewers who were taking charge of the meta reviewers, meta reviews, leading the discussion. And there we had six highly commended reviewers, all doing really good work. If you are doing reviewing, you're not quite sure what to be doing, these are the people to be talking to because they're doing wonderful stuff. 
Just thought we'd show you a quick section of a strong review to give you the sort of thing uh, that people are doing. Not only um, pointing out the negatives about a paper, but talking about the positives about a paper, talking about how the researchers could take this work forward. So these were the sorts of things we were looking for when we were going through the reviews. So that's a section of a strong review. We've also got one of our favourite quotes from a review. Um, <laughs> so it's not necessarily from the best reviewer, but we thought that was a great quote, and we enjoyed that. Just to show you that as programme chairs, we do take these reviews very seriously. We do look at them, we do read them, we do think about what's making them good, how we can make them better in the future. So I'd like to say, from all of us up here, enjoy the conference. Thank you to everybody who's put work in by submitting a paper, by presenting a paper, by reviewing a paper, by meta-reviewing a paper, by running a session, by chairing a session, by getting involved, by bringing in other people, by talking to other people, just by engaging. Thank you to all of you. We're really appreciative of you making it a great community. Thank you. So I'm now going to hand over to Al Esser, who's going to introduce our keynote. Uh, can I say at this point, everyone who's standing up, there are some seats. I can see quite a few seats in the middle. Please take the opportunity to move quickly um, so that you can be sitting down to hear Al do his introduction. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, I want to thank our hosts, uh, Arizona State University. Uh, not just thank them, but we work at McGraw-Hill Education with lots of colleges and universities. And for me, uh, both personally and professionally, uh, you saw Michael Crow this morning. Uh, Arizona State University really is in the forefront of educational transformation. So these are not just words, but uh, we, we see it uh, in our interactions. And it's not just the institution, but it's really a privilege and an honor uh, for me and my team uh, and our company to work with uh, the folks at Arizona State University. Uh, so I really want to thank them for organizing this conference. Uh, I joined McGraw-Hill Education a little over five years ago, uh, and uh, one of my principal charges was to form the data science team. And I asked around, like, who is demand? Demand? So, yeah, who's demand? The man, look, well, what man? The man who knows about theory and practice. Oh, the man, okay. In music, there's a tradition of master performances, master classes, right? Uh, a master comes, meets with the students, practitioners, and builds out the next generation. Ryan Baker, once I knew who the man was, we invited Ryan to hold master classes in learning science and data science. So he would come and meet with my team as they started to uh, gel. And he's been very generous with his time and expertise. Uh, and the past five years have been the most enjoyable, uh, both personally and professionally, and I owe that, and I'll, I think I'll, all my team members will say the same thing, and a lot of that is due to uh, Ryan Baker. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce the man, the true master, a true master, Ryan Baker. Um, let's see if we can get this keynet delayed by inability to use Macintosh. Here we go. 
So I've um, put a chair here. Um, only four or five of you saw that as we were setting up the talk, I managed to step off this and fall. And I don't want to do that again today. I managed to avoid injury the first time. Hopefully, I won't injure myself during the talk. Ah, I still can't do this. <clears throat> so thank you all for having me here today. This is a really great honor. Thank you for your kind words, Al. I really appreciate it. It's been a great honor to work with you and your colleagues as well. We've done some great work together, and I look forward to doing more. Um, this talk's entitled Some Challenges for the Next 18 Years of Learning Analytics. Why 18? Well, learning analytics has been really successful in just nine short years since the first conference. Student at-risk prediction systems are now used at scale in higher ed and K-12, and they're making a difference. And adaptive learning systems are now being used at scale in higher ed and K-12, and they're making a difference. And there's been a steady stream of discoveries and models in a range of once difficult areas to study. Collaborative learning, classroom participation and online connections, motivation and engagement, metacognition and self-regulated learning, and many other areas. And I could give a talk about all those things, full of praise and shout outs for all the great people in this room. And we already heard a few of those names, but I could keep the list going. So many great people in this room. And the talk will be full of warm fuzzies, and we'd all forget it by tomorrow afternoon. So instead of talking about the last nine years, I'd like to double that and go the other direction and talk about the next 18 years, twice as long as the history of LAC so far. But before I do that, I'd like to say a word about David Hilbert. Who here has heard of David Hilbert? OK, about a quarter of the room. So David Hilbert was a mathematician, a visionary. Uh, one could say that David was the man for mathematics, and also aware of spiffy hats. I mean, that's a great hat, right? In 1900, Hilbert gave a talk at the International Congress of Mathematicians. And at this talk, he outlined some of the problems that he thought would be particularly important for mathematicians over the following years. And this talk was, in my opinion, one of the most eloquent scientific speeches of all time. I encourage you to read it. Uh, it's available in its full text at this link. Hilbert framed problems concretely. He discussed what it would take to solve these problems. And he listed what would be necessary to demonstrate that, what, that these problems were solved. These were hard problems. Only 10 of his 23 problems have been solved so far. In the years since, uh, there's been a, ver a veritable cottage industry of these kinds of problems. Many lists of problems are grand challenges, including many in our field. And yet few of these have been anywhere near as influential as Hilbert's problems. Most of them are very different than what Hilbert listed. They just list big, difficult, vague problems, which is very different than what Hilbert did. And of course, there are obvious exceptions, like the Turing test, Loebner Prize, and so on. But the fact remains, lots and lots of grand challenges, very few that had anywhere near the impact of what Hilbert talked about. Today, I'd like to suggest a list of problems to you for learning analytics. And I know I'm no Hilbert, and also no uh, Gasovich, although I do have a Gasovich number of one, so yeah. And I do like spiffy hats. <laughs> but nonetheless, also learning analytics isn't mathematics. It's a lot easier to frame concrete problems and progress on them in a domain like math, I think, than a domain like learning analytics. But I hope you'll still nonetheless give me a few moments of your time to discuss what I see as some of the bigger upcoming challenges in our field, not necessarily new to this talk, with a conscious attempt to emulate Hilbert by trying to frame specific problems with conditions for how we know that we'll have made concrete progress on solving them. I've been lucky enough to get feedback on these ideas from some of the brightest people in the world. All the bad ideas are wholly mine. <laughs> so the first of these problems uh, is what I call the learning system wall. <clears throat> learning systems learn so much about a student, but the next learning system starts from scratch. A student might use Dreambox one year, Cognitive Tutor a couple years later, Alex a couple years after that. These are all great systems. They all learn a lot about the student, and it's forgotten the second they move on to the next system. A student might use, in a week, they might use Dreambox for some lessons and Khan Academy for others. My kids' previous school did this. They were using these two systems at the same time to cover the same content, and each system had to discover the exact same things about the student. 
It's like there's a wall between our learning systems and no information can get in or out. To, to paraphrase, if you seek better learning for students, tear down this wall. I got a couple laughs. I'm, the rest of you should read some history books. <laughs> it's not just a between systems problem. It's even between lessons in a single system. A student's struggle or rapid success in one lesson usually doesn't influence the estimation of the system in the next lesson. Now, there's been some early progress on this. I, I want to always give credit where credit's due, if I know about it. Eagle et al. have shown that there could be better student models if we transfer information between lessons within a student and within a single platform. But it was just a secondary data analysis, and it only involved three lessons in one system. So it was, in many ways, still a very basic demonstration of what might be possible. So I have a contest for you, a challenge, uh, which I hope you'll, some of you will choose to participate in. Take a student model developed using interaction data from one learning system. Now take this model's inferences for a student, let's call her Maria and honor my daughter, who's used that system. Take a second learning system developed by a different team. Use system one's model inference to change system two's model inference for the same student. So we have some info from the first system, and we transfer it to the second system, and the second system knows something. And not only that, let's not just change what the system knows, because if we just change what the system knows and we don't do anything with it, who cares? Let's actually have the second system change their behavior for Maria as well. So we're going to learn something in our first learning system, we're going to port it to our second learning system, and that system is going to do something different on the basis of that knowledge. The change could be just about anything. It could be different content the student starts with. Maybe we just start the student in a different place. We know that Maria knows fraction addition. We don't need to cover it again. It could be a different learning rate, like Ran Lu and Ken Katinger's work. We know that Maria is a fast learner, so we can uh, assume that she'll learn a little faster in our models. It could be a different interpretation of incorrect answers or other behavior. Maybe in Dreambox, Maria shows that she's got a misconception around adding the denominators, and so in Khan Academy, they go straight to when she makes an error that reflects that to, to interpreting that strongly. In my contest, if you will, um, the original model for the second system would have to be a good model for that construct. We'd already have to have something decent. It's fairly trivial to take absolutely nothing and improve it to be something that's not terrible, right? But um, if we start with a model that's actually decent on the second system, say with goodness metrics on held out data that are good enough to be published on their own in LAC or related conferences and journals after, let's say 2015, right? 2015 is when things really start to take off, we can say with model quality. So for example, for behavioral disengagement, a construct near and dear to my heart, AUC ROC of 0.75. For affect, 0.65. For latent knowledge estimation, 0.65. These are all kind of state-of-the-art-ish numbers. And I would say for my contest that publication in one of those venues after 2015 would also be good enough, right? Like, if it's a number good enough for LAC to publish it, it's probably a good number. The, entire, the new model for the second system would have to be able to take an entirely new set of students and, given the information from the first system, achieve better prediction than that original model. So we have to do better than something that's just basically decent. And the system behavior change would have to be able to actually run in the system. In other words, we'd have to actually connect the systems and loop it into uh, to, to interactive behavior. Not just an analysis for the sake of publishing. It'd be pretty easy, probably, to get two learning systems, get their data, link it together, and publish it. But actually getting the two systems to talk to each other, that's where the real challenge and power of this comes from. That's my first challenge to you. My second challenge, there's going to be six, so you can know when I'm about to be done. <laughs> second challenge I call differentiating, differentiating interventions and changing lives. Assignment deadline reminders for some, tiny American flags for others. Yes, a few people got that reference too. Everyone's seeing how old I am here. So today, we have many platforms that infer which students are at risk on the basis of learning analytics on LMS or other university or K-12 data. And these systems are used by instructors or other school personnel to make decisions about how to better support students, including selecting students for target interventions. And you know, I said this wasn't going to be a talk about celebrating the past, but isn't that awesome? Nine years of lack, and now we have all these systems out there. That really shows we've accomplished something as a community. 
Now, there's some evidence that these systems lead to better outcomes for students. There was a classic paper by Arnold and Pistilli here a few years ago at LAC. Um, there was a great paper by Malyron and colleagues um, in um, a journal special issue for Civitas. But there's also been some ongoing debate as to how substantial these effects are. <clears throat> and beyond that, we have to raise the question, are we really changing lives or are we patching short-term problems? So my contest is, take a group of undergraduates, a crawl that, a crawl? Take a group of undergraduates enrolled at an accredited university, whatever that means in the local context, and randomly assign them to a condition with an intervention, experimental, or no intervention, control, or establish uh, equivalence for a quasi-experiment, uh, which is done to the high standards of a really good quasi-experiment. Um, the condition could last up to a year long, or it could be short. And assign your learning analytics-based intervention to a subset of students in the experimental condition, um, where the model or where some model or some criterion determines which students actually receive intervention, and some number of students that's less than half, but a substantial number actually get the intervention. And publish or publicly declare what that model or criterion is. So okay, you've assigned it to some students. That's important because if we just give it to everybody, we don't need the learning analytics, right? If your intervention is call everybody in and say, hey, procrastination is bad, we don't need analytics. The point is that we're gonna intervene on the students who need it. <clears throat> Identify in advance with documentation for groups. In the so it's a two by two cross, experimental control, and the model thinks they should get the intervention or the model thinks they shouldn't get the intervention. We have only one group that gets the intervention. This is, pointer's not gonna work for me. We have only one group that gets the intervention. They're in the experimental condition and the model thinks they should get an intervention. If the model thinks they should get an intervention but they're in the control condition, no intervention. If the model doesn't think they should get an intervention and they're in the experimental condition, again, no intervention. They only get the intervention in this one case. At least three years later, <clears throat> collect some success outcome that matters. Uh, and it could be just about anything. Standardized test score. You could imagine giving a uh, group of students intervention first year of college and see if they do better on the GRE. Attendance of graduate school. Employment in their chosen field. Um, personal income. Personal happiness. There's a lot of possible measures it could be. But the point is, make an enduring change through an intervention that's targeted. So I would suggest that we would want to see that the experimental condition where they got the intervention, these students perform statistically significantly better than the control condition where we know they would have gotten the intervention based on a published model with some reasonably high effect size. Um, at the same time, show that the students in the experimental condition who didn't get the intervention don't perform statistically differently than the students in the control condition who didn't get the intervention. So by doing this, we're showing that our intervention is really what's making the difference based on the analytics. <clears throat> this is a real challenge. Uh, who here has uh, seen this paper by Pashler and colleagues? A few people. This is a classic paper. Uh, proposed a similar test for visualizer, verbalizer learning styles, and they found that all the research they found had failed the test. This paper, I think in many ways, although there had been several papers arguing this before this, was really what put kind of a, a nail in the coffin of the idea that learning styles were really something we should be focusing on. So it's, it's a good design, it's a good standard. And we can use it to determine, do our learning analytics interventions work, and do they make a difference for variables in the long term? Okay, third challenge. I see nobody running out of the room in fury, that's good. Um, I, I call this one the Instructor Speak Spanish, Algorithm Speak Swahili Challenge. So we put a ton of effort into building models of important phenomena. We craft the perfect recurrent neural network and we validate that it has brilliant predictive performance. And then our brilliant model makes a prediction that a user, an instructor for instance, finds non-intuitive. They don't understand what that prediction means and we can't explain it because our brilliant model is utterly inscrutable and the instructor, reasonably enough, doesn't trust the model. And then they don't use it. Right, that's a big problem. If they don't understand it, and it tells them something that they don't believe, they will just say it's wrong, even when it's right. So the challenge is make the decision-making processes of deep learning or a comparable advanced algorithm understandable for an instructor or other similar stakeholder, like an academic advisor, who doesn't personally have an academic background. It's not good enough to just take the uh, academic advisors who already have a master's degree in data science. 
So the challenge would be build a model that predicts a learner success outcome, <coughs> such as high school dropout or college course failure, using an advanced algorithm with at least 100 parameters. And I guess I put quotations on advanced algorithm because as you probably know, a recurrent neural network is not going to have 100, it's going to have 10 million. The model has to be a good model for the construct. Again, goodness metrics on held out data that are good enough to appear here. Once you've got that good model, find five data scientists and five instructors who weren't part of your original development team and design an explanation of how the algorithm works. A visualization, a video, a text, interactivity are fine. Just no human being out there to answer questions. Give them five case studies or examples of specific students. Ask them each to tell you what decision the algorithm would make for each student and explain why. Do the instructors agree with the data scientists? Say, at least 80% of the time, both in terms of what the model's decision will be and what its reason is. And have two independent researchers code the data for the reasons and see if they get acceptable iterator reliability. So by doing this, by taking a data scientist and an instructor, creating a way to communicate to them and making sure they understand it the same way, we'll have made progress towards making these inscrutable models more scrutable, more understandable, and ultimately more trustworthy. And by doing that, we can create a dialogue. Maybe when, these, when uh, users of these models don't trust them, they'll talk to us and we can figure out what the, dis what the uh, breakdown is. At the very least, if, even if they don't always agree, if they know where it's coming from, they're more likely to have confidence than if it's just a black box that makes incomprehensible predictions. Fourth challenge, we're halfway there. Knowledge tracing beyond the screen. And this uh, image was taken from Martinez Maldonado's work. So we've been reasonably successful at producing models that can infer learner knowledge or at least predict immediate correctness in computer-based learning environments. And when I say reasonably successful, I mean 35 products or something on the market, right? Probably 70. Every system, it seems like, it calls itself adaptive learning has this. But mostly, these environments involve one student sitting at one computer and providing textual input numbers, multiple choice responses, and so on. The problem is that most learning still doesn't take place with one student sitting at one computer. There's things like collaborative project work and discussion forum-based learning and classrooms where teachers and students talk to each other. And this room knows that. And there's been a lot of good work on this stuff. I'm not meaning to carry uh, coals to Newcastle. The challenge is, though, can we detect student knowledge in these contexts the same way we can in the easier-to-study contexts? So my contest for you, take audio, visual, and or physical data on learning from a setting where there are at least four students engaged in the same learning activity at the same time, and build a model that can infer at least four distinct skills or knowledge components for each student. Now, when I gave a practice talk on this, people said, why isn't one good enough? The reason is because I bet you could get one knowledge component just from whether the students are engaged, right? Just from whether they're participating, that would probably be good enough. But distinguishing four different skills at the same time is probably harder. So the model has to be able to predict immediate future performance on these skills, the same standard that we often use for validating knowledge models in existing one-on-one -on -one systems. And for a sample of new students, the model has to achieve AUC ROC greater than the typical criterion for those kind of models. So if we can establish the same level of goodness for models of student knowledge in collaborative and real world settings as we can for one-on-one -on -one learning with a computer, we'll have taken what is probably the most widely used uh, aspect of adaptive learning and made it accessible for um, a much wider range of learning activities. Fifth challenge, generalizability, the general purpose boredom detector. I don't know if you guys can read my, um, my red text here, but imagine this, the, the, that we can now tell across these three different systems whether a student is bored. Although that student's probably more than just bored. So there's been a lot of success on affect detection, on detecting academic emotion or affect solely from interactions. Folks have detected boredom, engaged concentration, frustration, confusion, delight and joy. I've put a few moments into this problem myself. But a big problem is that these current models are not generalizable. They have to be rebuilt almost from scratch for new learning platforms. There's some common tools for field observation, the hard app that my lab's developed, and some tools for data synchronization. There's some experience in feature engineering that generalizes. We've gotten faster at this over the years across labs, but it's still a lot of work. 
Fiona Hollins and Ipek Bakir estimated that building these kind of affect detection models for a new system costs about $75,000. That's not, you know, prohibitively expensive, but it's certainly not free either. It's certainly a good chunk of work. <clears throat> Another problem is that even when we build these models for a system, if we change that system, and our systems are always changing, it's not yet clear what changes to a learning system cause them to break down. So for example, my colleagues and I have seen that models of whether a student is gaming a system break down when the hints are removed from the learning system, but they don't break down when an affective agent is added. So why does one transfer? Why does the other not transfer? We don't entirely know yet. So the contest is to build a model of student boredom using interaction data from one or more learning systems. Um, take that model and apply it to data from an entirely new system built by a different development team where the interaction is not broadly identical. Because you can imagine that you could probably trivially solve this just by saying, oh, here's my algebra tutor and here's my algebra two tutor. And they look identical, but gosh, they're different systems because we sell them separately, right? Cutting across different development teams, again, would be the sort of thing that would make this really credible. Um, so you might imagine, for example, to pick two systems that some of you may know, Assessments and Cognitive Tutor both have content from middle school mathematics, but the design of the activities is fairly different. So this would kind of be fair game. You'd want to apply the model with no tweaking, no refitting, no modifications. So the features would have to be defined in the same way or in some way that's general across systems. So it might be okay to say that if a student's one standard deviation is slower than the mean speed, in terms of that system speed, that we can also think of one standard deviation slower in the other system. That's kind of a generic feature. Um, but for example, we couldn't say, okay, we're gonna refit all the cutoffs for this new system. Because then it wouldn't be walk up and use, you'd have to collect the data, you'd have to retrain and so on. Collect some kind of ground truth could be a binary or categorical self-report, could be field observations, could be video coding. If you did one of those, you'd want to meet standard expectations for what Cohen's Kappa iterator reliability is, and demonstrate that the new model works uh, in the new system to the same standard that we expect these models to work when we build them in general. There's been some early progress on this one that I want to give shout outs to. One is Paquette et al's work. He built a detector of gaming the system on uh, interaction data from the cognitive tutor system, and he took it to the assessment system, and with no modification, it was able to still predict gaming the system. Um, in this case, actually, it was a really interesting effort where Luke, instead of using uh, standard machine learning tools, actually did very thorough knowledge engineering, and uh, where he interviewed a uh, person who'd done a lot of this coding, and uh, built a model of her process, took it back to her, talked about it with her, took it back, modified it some more, actually ran some data with her watching through the model. She commented on it and they went back and forth until they were both felt that the model fully captured her reasoning. Again, he did that on cognitive tutor data, used on assessments. On the other hand, because gaming system is something that we can verbalize to a greater degree how we recognize than student boredom, it does become an easier challenge than this. Another piece of work along these lines is Hud et al.'s paper at CHI this year, where they built a detector of affect using machine learning for an algebra course in one platform, and then they validated that it worked on a geometry course, different course, but still same platform, same interaction design. So there's been progress for this one. I feel like this one's one that we probably will get uh, solved relatively soon. Sixth challenge, last challenge. The New York City and MARFA problem. So models are mostly built in the samples that we have ready at hand. Whether it's our current population of university students, um, our current user base of the, current, of the adaptive learning system we're building the model for, or just students who are relatively easy to survey or observe. But what happens when your population changes? Say you've built a model for your university, but your university starts taking in a lot of transfer students from Nevada. I work with one university system where they actually had something very much like this happen. They had a university in their city shut down. They got a lot of transfer students in one lump. And guess what? Now they had to uh, see if their models would still work. Maybe you've built your learning system on data from students in the continental US, and now you have to adopt it. Now it's being adopted in Alaska. Will your models work? 
And third, maybe you need to use your model for students that are just different than the ones you surveyed or observed. If we do our field observation methods to make a model of affect on students from Massachusetts, we want to use the model in West Virginia, do we trust it? And this is a challenge for inclusion because a lot of the populations that we want to focus on including, and I know this is the conference theme this year, a lot of the populations we want to focus on including are the ones it's harder to collect data for. I call this the New York City and Marfa problem. Who here has tried to do research in New York City? A few hands. So you probably know it's hard to collect data and do research in New York City because of very restrictive rules. You have to go get fingerprinted. You have to have everybody in your lab go get fingerprinted. They have to be fingerprinted at this one office in Brooklyn. You can't be fingerprinted somewhere else. If you're a researcher in Philadelphia, that's annoying. But it's more than just that. At other contexts, you get a teacher, they say they like the study, they write you a letter. Maybe they go to their assistant principal. Assistant principal writes you a letter. Now you're good. In New York City, you're not even supposed to talk to the school until you've gone through the IRB process of the New York City DOE IRB, which makes it hard because then you, find, you design a study that is inconvenient for the school. Um, the New York City DOE IRB has very restrictive policies, which are much more restrictive than the federal legislation for uh, IRBs. All told, running a study in New York City takes about nine months of preparation time in addition to what you'd do in another place. And I say this having run several studies in NYC. Marfa, Texas does not have incredibly restrictive policies on data use, but it's 194 miles from El Paso International Airport, which is not exactly a huge airport itself. If I wanted to run a study there, I've got to first fly from Philadelphia to Dallas, then I gotta fly from Dallas to El Paso, then I gotta rent a car, not all of my grad students drive, and drive 194 miles through the desert, along the Texas-Mexico border. Um, so it's not exactly the most convenient place to do research, and because of that, towns like Marfa tend to have a lot less research than uh, suburbs. So what happens is, because of these kind of factors, most research in the United States is done in uh, upper middle class suburbs and relatively smaller cities. Um, I think similar patterns occur in other countries, just with differences depending on what the local conditions are. We want our analytics to be just as valid for these students in New York City and Marfa, Texas, as for our students who are easier to research. So one solution uh, that we talk about uh, in Ocumpa et al. is to collect data from all the populations you want the model to work on and try to validate these models on all these populations. And that's both sensible and crazy and practical, right? Because we just got done talking about how some populations are hard to get to. It's more feasible to collect all the data in MOOCs than blended learning systems, for example, and you say, okay, well, this isn't a problem for MOOCs, but even in MOOCs, we don't know what the relevant populations are entirely. Which are the groups of learners that we need to validate our models on? So my challenge, this sixth and last challenge, is to develop a model that just works for new populations. So the contest is, build a model of one of the following constructs. High school dropout, college course failure, affect, disengaged behavior, learning strategy. I pick these because these are things that have all been relatively studied. We know we can model all of these. <clears throat> the model, again, has to be a good model for the construct, publishable at LAC. And now, once we've built that model, we've got to collect pop data for a new population that's substantially different than the original population. So we can't just hold out a little bit of our data in the first place. We actually have to go collect a new data set because, as you all probably know, even when you hold out the data set, it's kind of easy to snoop your data. It's hard to really prevent yourself from doing so. But if you collect a new data set that wasn't available to you when the original model was developed, then you've kind of put a check on yourself. This new data set should be substantially different. The population should be more than half belonging to some group that was rare in the original data set, say 10% or less. And where that group differs from the original training set in terms of, for example, degree of urbanicity, rural versus non-rural, Okunpa's work and some other work argues that, uh, that rural versus urban students actually are very different in the United States, for example. Race, uh, based on some nationally recognized census category in your country. This doesn't have to be just US, right? There are different racial and ethnic breakdowns around the world. Um, native language, nationality, or poverty using a nationally appropriate and common category. So some demographic difference that people think makes a difference Collect a new sample that is dominant in terms of that, but wasn't in your original population. And your prediction for your new population has to have limited degradation, has to be, say, less than 0.1 in AUC, ROC, or Pearson-Spearman correlation, 
or, and while at the same time remaining better than chance. Right? So if you go down from, say, 0.59 to 0.49 in AUCROC, you haven't actually accomplished much. And if you go down from 0.85 in AUCROC to 0.63, maybe you're still better than chance, but there's something that's changed a lot, and it's worth finding out what it is. So in this last challenge I, I brought up, the goal is, again, to take a model from one context, apply it to a different context, and see if it still works. <clears throat> so to reprise these challenges briefly, the first one, the learning system wall, we want to build a model in one system and have it transfer information to another system in a way that makes that system's prediction better and changes behavior. I will probably put up a website with this later, uh, so follow my Twitter feed. Um, the second challenge, differentiating interventions and changing lives. Do a really rigorous test that shows that people who got your intervention have better outcomes in the longer term than people who didn't in a controlled study, where we also make sure that it doesn't just benefit everybody. Third one, instructors speak Spanish, algorithms speak Swahili. Build an explanation of a complex model that uh, practitioners can understand as well as data scientists. <clears throat> knowledge tracing beyond the screen. Get the same quality of knowledge tracing um, for, be, for learning that occurs in groups or in classrooms as learning that occurs one student, one computer. Fifth challenge, the general purpose boredom detector. A detector of boredom that just works in entirely new... Uh, in an entirely new system. And finally, the New York City and MARFA problem. Build a model that works on a new population. So a lot of these have to do with generalizability of various sorts of transferability, but I think it's also important to remember interpretability goes with that. Um, I've thought about these as possible challenges that represent a, a span of things we can be looking at, although clearly they don't cover everything. So, you might say, why do I care about solving these challenges? I mean, sure, they might be interesting problems, but why don't, you know, why should I actually care about this? So I'd like to announce a prize here and today at Learning Analytics that will go to the teams that are first to solve each of these challenges. But first, a word on how this prize was established. We all know that there are many generous billionaires out there in this day and age. I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> who strive to give back to the world what they've earned, <clears throat> who yearn to better support education however they can, marshalling their resources, their intelligence, their efforts to make this world a better place, and for whom $45,000 is the merest of pocket change, not even worth picking up if it fell on the street. And none of them will take my calls. <laughs> so, Announcing the Baker Learning Analytics Prizes. Blap. <laughs> With an award of, drum roll please. <laughs> yes. If you solve one of these six challenges, I will give you one dollar. For each. I, I am committing I'm committing six dollars here, which faculty salaries being what they are. <laughs> US, USD, USD. I, I will even frame it forever solves these challenges, if that's what you want. Um, I, that's harder. You have to actually get him to co-author with you, because uh, I don't think this counts for gasific numbers. It's true, although I actually am not trying to get co-authors out of this. I would love for people just to do this um, without necessarily working with me. And anyways, it's good to see what pe the people are motivated by a dollar and by a gas pick number. <laughs> so in this talk, I proposed a few challenges that I think would bring our field forward and some conditions under which we would know there's been progress. I hope you found these ideas compelling, or at least thought-provoking. Ultimately, a field moves forward if it takes on big goals that make a difference. <clears throat> One of the things we have to watch out for is becoming obsessed with tiny optimizations on small problems. It's really easy to say, my cool new algorithm can do 0 .003 better on a data set that everyone agrees is an important data set. And you could publish for that pretty easily. 
What I've presented today might not be the right big goals. I'm not going to guarantee that. But at minimum, I hope I've provoked you to think about what the right big goals would be. If it's not generalizability, interpretability, applicability, and transferability, it's worth saying, what are the right challenges we should be addressing as a field? So whatever those are, I encourage you to go out and pursue those. I look forward to seeing you all in 2037, uh, first time attendees as well, when I hope we'll have achieved all these goals or everyone will have agreed that these were really bad ideas in the first place. <laughs> Thank you. Great. I am told I have 10 minutes for questions that I can pick as I see fit. Danielle. That's a great point. So the, the comment is, I did not say the word theory. And you're absolutely right, Danielle. And so one of my points is that um, when I'm taking a theoretical approach to each of these problems, you have to be contrasting a few. And so one theory is that you cannot get it. That, um, that it, it's slightly culturally insensitive to think that one model will fit all populations, fit a population of ninth graders, fit a population <coughs> of college students. So when we're building models, we're actually looking for how we need to modify the model as a function of context. Do I need to start over? <laughs> or or I, I'm assuming you can hear my voice. Um, so I believe that we need to think about not the goal of generalizing models always. Of course, one model should, should, we should always be testing generalization. That's the requirement for publication. But how do we need to think theoretically about these problems so that we can modify our models in systematic ways? And it, Potentially, it's because I'm focused on learning, um, and in particular, strategies in reading and writing and math, but um, and not necessarily affect. But um, when we're building models, we do need to be sensitive to different theories, testing theories, and how the models need to change. And I doubt that you meant to ignore that. So I think there's a lot of great ideas in what you said, Danielle. Um, and let me try to break down a couple of these. Um, let me start with the question of, is it culturally insensitive to say, insensitive to say that we should tr strive for universal models? I think that's a really important question that, uh, that gets the heart of a lot of work that we've been doing and you've been doing and a lot of folks have been doing. I want to first make a quick shout out for the journal Computer-Based Learning in Context, which has its inaugural special issue appearing later this spring. Um, it, Didith Rodrigo in the Philippines and I are co-editing it, and that's, that kind of theme is exactly what we want to publish in that journal. Um, to me, the second of these challenges is about differentiating interventions. I didn't say specifically between demographic groups or populations, but that could be one of the things you'd think about. Part of the challenge is to figure out what can generalize and what can't, and how to build a model that works across groups and which differences matter. And we don't even have a vocabulary for some of those things. I think we need theory on, on uh, what are the differences that matter and how do they manifest their, their matteringness. Um, at the same time, I think there's scope for making models that work more generally. I would take the example of Think, for example, of how phones and the voice recognition on phones these days trains itself to the individual user. 
That's a good example of a model that is relatively intended to be general across people, and it works across a lot of people, though not everybody, but spe uh, develops specialization. The second point you brought up that I think is really important is the word theory, and you brought that at the very beginning. And you're right, these are relatively atheoretical challenges. These are, for the most part, practical challenges about what can we do as opposed to what can we learn. I frame them that way consciously, um, in part because I think that framing challenges about what we can do is in many ways easier than framing changes about what we can learn and lends itself to easier progress. Figuring out what the progress step should be on a general theory of culture and context, which is a topic I've been interested in years, is it's really hard, right? And I suspect that to the extent that we could figure out what populations things could generalize across and what can't, which we can only really see when we have a paradigm of actually looking for generalizability, which I, I do want to take, take issue with one thing you said, which is that generalizability is an expectation for publication usually. I don't think it usually is. I think that our expectations for generalization for what we will publish are usually pretty low. And I think we actually have to get past that, and I hope that this can be part of getting past that, to a world where people are expected to say where they think things will generalize. So great comments, thank you. Alyssa, did you have a? It was similar enough, I'll let you explain. Okay. Right. I'd like to suggest um, de-weaponization. <laughs> Say it one more time. De-weaponization, as in weapons of math destruction. Um, so one of the things I worry about is that models make predictions that affect people not always in a positive way. Um, you've got your Pygmalion effect, um, et cetera. So one of the things that I'm working on in the software that I'm, and models that I'm developing are ways for people about whom predictions are being made being able to contest and alter the model. I think there's a lot of value to that kind of idea. Um, I think that right now part of the problem is that how can people contest it when they can't even understand it? I agree, and, and that folds into it. You've mentioned making the model interpretable to the instructors, but I would like to generalize that to making the model interpretable to anyone about whom predictions are being made. Could be the instructor, the instructional designer of the course, the student, um, you know, a whole range of, of different kinds of people. Um, and incorporating that into what we consider to be the accuracy of the model. So some kind of, of standard way of showing that your model and system, because it's more than just the model, it's, it's the presentation system yeah. and visualization and explanation, gives all the participants a way to help improve the value of the model by commenting on what they think is working, what isn't, having, having some way of actually folding that into the system. I think that's a really valuable suggestion. In many ways, I think that's the next step beyond what my current number three is, because I think communicating to, uh, to students in many ways is harder than communicating to instructors, especially depending on who your student is. <clears throat> One challenge, I think, in folding in student opinions is, that, so, is, is the challenge of gaming the system. So we've seen, for example, that students not only try to get systems to let them move on without learning, but that students also game the researchers. So in one of our first studies on gaming the system, we had a software agent that reduced gaming the system, improved student learning, but was annoying. And students who had demonstrably better learning in that experimental condition than they would have in the control, told the researchers on the survey that the system was wrong, the system was bad, and the system hurt their learning. Now, did they believe it hurt their learning? I suspect they didn't actually believe it hurt their learning. I suspect they disliked it. But that's the problem that we have to face, and that's a really important challenge for the future of the field. Thank you. I saw a hand back there. And it was about something in the US, actually. It was about the criminal justice system in the US, and it was about the different demographics that exist, and it was about uh, sentencing and recid recidivism and that sort of stuff. The interesting part of that was that the realities for the different groups were different. So you, if you 
applied something that worked really well for white guys. It did not work well for black guys. The realities were different. Where they're living was different. The, the environment they're in, the people they're around, everything around their lives, where they were born, how much money they had, the whole reality was different. So the model just failed. So um, generalizing between groups is a bit of a false challenge. What you really want is a model that works well for different groups. So you mentioned the rural case. Yeah, sure, you, you might want to have something that knows that someone came from a rural environment, but you want it to work well for them and also work well for the city. So you, what you really want is tailoring and to know where do people come from and make the right decisions that don't impact everyone else. <coughs> Putting everyone into one model <coughs> is kind of a false challenge. I, I partially agree and I partially disagree. First of all, I want to make a quick shout out to Josh Gardner's talk on Thursday, which will actually talk about ways to quantify the degree to which models work differently for different populations. So we are very interested in that. Um, but the, the idea of making a model that's different for different populations has its own challenges. Um, I can see two right off the top of my head. The first one is that there are societal concerns around a model that treats one student different than another student based on the color of their skin. That is a really uh, big societal challenge and figuring out how to address the idea of making models equally effective for different groups and yet not having models that are explicitly biased against certain groups is challenging. The second part though is we'll never know all the groups that matter. If we have to have a different model for every group, just taxonomizing what the groups that matter will be really hard and inherently that'll bias against groups that are rarer. I've done some recent work that hasn't been published yet, for example, looking at military connected students and showing that K-12 predictive analytics risk models are built on uh, broader populations don't work as well on military connected students. That's a population that our field I don't think has been paying attention to, but it's one that has its own aspects. We could also look at migrant workers. Uh, our our uh, host here spoke about Native American communities. You know, the Native American communities in the United States alone have amazing diversity and are heavily understudied. So I would say that we want to try to figure out how well our model works for different groups. We want to try to build models that take account of information of different groups where it leads to fairer outcomes, but we also have to just pay attention to the idea of models that will just work on as many learners as possible, because if we don't, we'll inherently discriminate against people who are in communities too small to receive the attention of funders. Thank you all for your great comments. I'll be around later today and for the rest of the conference.